Hello, welcome to our morning service. It's Sunday the 22nd of May. A joy to worship with you, to come together before our God and use the medium of technology to celebrate as one. If you notice as we begin our service today, this very afternoon, Loxford Nifold Open Gardens are coming together to join the villages, the church, the community. Huge thanks to Rosemary and Ewan for pioneering and leading us through it. It should be an amazing afternoon. Please join us if you can at North Hall or indeed keep us in prayer. And then the week ahead of us, we are praying like almost never before. We have a week of 24-7 prayer starting in Loxford Church and halfway through we're going to move to Allfold. So both churches will be open through the course of the week. Please sign up if you haven't yet. There is still time, but we want an unbroken chain of prayer, praying for our nation, our community, the world, whatever is on your heart. Just come have time with the Lord, just to spend in his presence on there. And then one or two dates in June that I want to flag up for prayer and also for engagement too. Our Jubilee to celebrate uh, the Queen, uh, 3rd, 4th and 5th of June, both at Loxford and Allfold. So many events going on. If you can be there, we'd love to join with you. But please, please hold them in your prayers. And then Canon J. John is doing a conference on evangelism on the 11th of June. Tickets available, £10. Come and hear, come and be inspired to go out and proclaim this amazing message with skills, tools, and encouragement and enthusiasm as well. And ladies, your turn for breakfast on the 18th of June. Lou Harrington, come and hear her share about her time and life in ministry. That's all I'm gonna say and notice is wise. We're gonna turn our minds to prayer as we worship our Lord in heaven. The collect for today, the sixth Sunday of Easter. God, our Redeemer, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your son. Grant that as by his death he recalled us to life, so by his continual presence in us he may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to start our service in song two. So please join us as we sing, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes. 
Holy, 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 I want to see you. There itself is a glimpse of heaven, you know, where they, in Revelation, they fell down before the throne and sang holy, holy, holy. We say it in our time of communion as well, but it is such an important response to all Jesus has done for us, to call him holy. And our joy, our gift to see him. Let's stay in that attitude of prayer. We're going to have our reading from Daniel 3 in just a moment, and then I'm going to share some thoughts uh, from the Word. The reading is taken from Daniel chapter 3, the image of gold and the blazing furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisers, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he'd set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisers, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O King, live forever. You have issued a decree, O King, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music. If you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. 
But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to die up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisers, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, perfects, governors, and royal advisers crowded around them. Thank you so much for that reading. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, will you please open our hearts and minds to hear and receive all you want to say to us today. Amen. I wonder, have you ever been caught between a rock and a hard place? I can certainly remember one young lad who was. Many years ago, I was working in a boarding house uh, in London and Saturday night, my duty, and I just walked in there doing my, my rounds in terms of supervision and checking uh, the boys in as they came uh, back from various places they'd been on the Saturday night. And uh, in uh, walks uh, a, a sixth form boy, let's call him Toby, and he walks straight past me. And then about two seconds later, this cloud of smoke wafts past me as well. I say, hang on a minute, Toby, come here, we need a chat. And long story short, um, I had obviously busted him, who'd been out for a smoke and came back in. And he then pours out this whole long sorry saga, knowing full well that he was under quite serious caution at this point, that his whole family smoked. When he was out with them in the t table, restaurants at home, he smoked with them. And they permitted it, they encouraged it, a 17 year old lad. And this was his normal habit at home and whenever he saw his family, and do you know what he said after that? He said, look, what chance did I have? What chance did I have? Some habits are so ingrained, they're so part of the culture of the place you're in. He was willing to bear that cost and say, it's me, I'm not gonna change. So our reading today is one where I say, many of us probably, if it's like me, go back to Sunday school, brought up with this really clear image. So clear in my mind was a God who rescues us from the fire if we truly put our trust in him. Yet having delved deeper into it this season and in recent weeks, I know it's far from just a story of courage and integrity, but a story that draws us right into that exilic world and asks the same questions of us as it did to those three friends of Daniel. Verse four, this is what you're commanded to do. You must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. We heard those words before, this is what you're commanded to do. That's right, it takes us right back into Exodus and Moses bringing down the 10 commandments. A really powerful, tangible reminder of those commandments. But just go back and look at Mark 12, Jesus and his summary of the law. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. You shall love your neighbor 
as yourselves. There are no commandments greater than these. So when we look at that, in that, that lens of, of what we're commanded to do, we have got to diagnose the problem. I diagnosed the problem last week. I spotted a wasp nest in our shed. You know what? Diagnosis is easy. It's very clearly a wasp nest. But just in case I was unsure of what was hanging there, the wasp flew past my head into it just after then. I looked up and there it was. I knew there was a problem. A problem I wanted to throw into the fire. A King Nebuchadnezzar fire. Sometimes when we meet problems, they are easily pointed out. They scream at us loud and proud. Paul yells at the Galatians in chapter 3, verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Yeah, but other times it might be a bit quieter. It might lie under the surface. I did some training recently on unconscious bias. Reminded me afresh that we don't know what we don't know. All the more reason why we need to ask for help, ask those nearest and dearest to us to point out problems to us. Sometimes we don't even realise what those problems are or the habits we've got that have become destructive. Maybe I could just look at that wasp nest up there and go, oh, they're probably just hoverflies. But I think what this passage is truly saying to me, to us, saying what destructive habits do we need to leave in that refiner's fire? From the 1990s to the 2010s, you know, hospital cases caused by socks and tights injuries rose almost 11 times, from 1,000 to 11,000 a year. Almost 150 people per year get injured using bread bins. Another 320 get injured in toilet roll holder related ways. And would you believe it, even injuries from beanbags rose over a period of a few years from 950 a year to 1300. You know what, that made them four times as dangerous to people as meat cleavers. Fortunately, armchair injuries fell in that time from 19,000 a year to 17,000. Phew, it isn't all bad news. Just for reference, over 20,000 were admitted in one year alone for wasp sting related injuries. So why do I share hospital statistics like that? It's not about the risk to our physical bodies. God isn't calling us just to let go of worldly dangers either. We're being called to properly let go of destructive habits, ones that have eternal consequences, not, albeit rare, risk of physical injury. Going back 20 odd years, when I was a young student in my very early 20s, I loved a beer. In fact, I loved several beers. I used to find, at times, I'd start drinking at 11 in the morning and carry right on through. I was with a group of people for whom the culture, the lifestyle we lived, that was the norm. We would just spend our time in the student common room, the bars, drinking. It impacted so much. My study went out the window. Friendships suffered. New friendships might have come along, but they were never stable. My embryonic faith at that time, cast aside. My witness, clearly rubbish. My life was a situational alcoholic. I can look at that, I can look back. But it took my friends to actually turn around and say, Oi, we think you're drinking too much. We think it's dangerous. I loved them for that. And I began a path to say, OK, enough, time to change. Now, I have to say, not all clergy are reformed alcoholics before you get that impression of us. But we are all hopefully being reformed from our destructive habits. Just pause for a moment. What worldly pursuits and expectations and rules are you and me being drawn into? What is God calling out of you today? Is it lust, immorality, greed, self-centeredness, addictions, porn, gambling? Where do we earnestly need to change? Paul, in his letters, doesn't shy away from calling out destructive habits again and again and again to all of the churches. Because he sees their destruction, he sees their hypocrisy, he sees the failure 
of mission of the church unless we turn and seek help. So, OK, we can diagnose the problem on there. If we know there's a problem, what keeps us there? Well, maybe you, like me, might have lived in ignorance. We don't know what we don't know. Fear can hold us back. Lethargy, the custom, poverty, control maybe from others too. They're all reasons for staying in a place that is of the world. But there are two key words, I think, that hold us there. Culture and cost. We're often sailing along with the proverbial culture of the world around us. How much has this world in this country moved in our lifetimes? What has become thoroughly normalised now would have been unthinkable decades back. Some of that clearly for the good. Behaviours and practices and equality, diversity, have brought so much more in fairness and opportunity. Institutional racism, sexism, being called out, recognised, lamented, and albeit slowly, beginning to be addressed. Yet we're governed by a culture that wants to erect borders between our nation and our neighbours, wants to selectively support the migratory arrivals of refugees from some war-torn nations, but not all. And a culture that pays lip service to levelling up. Whatever the reality is, social divide just gets wider. Where are we with that prevailing culture? Are we sailing with it? Do we get caught up? Do we have a passive acceptance of rules? Do we know what we're doing is living of the world? Sometimes in groups and in meetings, you can have a, a decision-making scale rather than just yes or no to a big decision there. You can have a five-point scale. It might be, yes, I'm 100% behind this. Yeah, I'm fairly well there, but I've got one or two questions, reservations. Third one, mm, I, I'm kind of not really there yet, but I don't want to stand in the way. Fourthly, I really am not sure on this, but if others all go for it, I'm not going to be a complete objector. I'll hold my nose and we'll get there. Or maybe five, no way. Absolute blanket, categoric no. And sometimes it helps us to think through where rules, where culture is. And rather than just being a yes or a no and being swept into that, actually sometimes we need to look at it afresh and say, maybe there's a more nuanced answer there. Culture doesn't always come easily. And then secondly, cost on there. Maybe we only get gentle warnings about the cost, not strong enough to cause us to need to act. It's also perhaps the same as not knowing what would happen if we didn't act. But I think much more we live in that world that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego lived in. And they saw the cost firsthand. In verse 8, they were isolated. They'd been denounced by those around them. In verse 13, they were anxious. They'd been summoned to a furious king. Verse 14, they were demoralised. They'd been grilled by the king. In verse 15, they were resigned to their fate. They'd been threatened and sent to death. And verse 19, they were hopeless for rescue because the fire had been heated seven times hotter. It seemed there's nothing they could do. So the key question, what will be the end result if we are to stay in that place of habit? Back to the example of the boiled frog. A very cruel experiment many decades ago showed that if you put a frog in boiling water, it will leap out. But if you put it in warm water and gradually increase the temperature to boiling point, it would stay in and die. Stark, horrible, chilling. But it takes us to a place where ultimately we see where habit will lead. I don't have a culture of removal of wasps' nests, nor expertise of how to protect myself other than avoid them. But when I saw that nest, I did some research and I quickly learned how nests get built, how big they become, and how many wasps might call it home eventually. Some wise heads even proffered solutions on how to remove it safely and the risks if I left it too mature. Sin 
when it's allowed to mature, gives rise to death. A fully grown nest of wasps by the garden in late summer will be asking for serious trouble. If we can identify our destructive habits, if we can see where they might lead them, we should be saying we need to chop them off. They need to be chopped off from taking root. Sin, living through these habits, cannot have a home in us. Sometimes that problem needs to be tackled more than once, help from others, and clinically, decisively, to make sure it's been destroyed. But we can't do this successfully unless we have that sure hope that God is with us. So I wonder, and I bet you're wondering, what happened to my wasp nest? Well, I considered the costs and the risks and eventually decided it was better to remove than leave. I went through my five-point scale of my questions. Shall we let it stay? I decided I couldn't hold my nose and vote for it, nor could I sit passively pretending it wasn't so much of a problem. I voted unequivocally no to it staying. Did I have a hope of success? Maybe. Was I anxious? Yes. Did I feel alone? Totally. So I poked it with a sharp stick. Guess what? Wasp flew out of it. I retreated and researched some more. Then I left the door open for a couple more days before returning. I poked it again, armed with serious fly spray and a hat. Nothing happened. They were out. So I chopped it from the ceiling onto the floor. What had started with just perhaps an orange sized nest with a few wasps in there could well have become the size of a tree with hundreds and hundreds of wasps in there. But this was now gone, chopped away. So an application of this call, how do we have that sure hope of rescue? And how do we cut out the destructive habits? Well, rescue, firstly, we need to ask who or what can help us? How we can avoid getting shipwrecked. Love that verse, verse nine, the irony of it, where the satraps, the astrologers all come together, say, O king, live forever. But the previous chapter has told us the path that will be followed in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, that of ultimate destruction. What this does, it points to a king there on earth who will be destroyed, but it reminds us of a king who really does live forever and through grace will be rescued. Verse 15, the question is asked, who can rescue? We have a worship song that we sing quite often. It just has that line, who alone can rescue? Who alone can save? Jesus. And in verse 29, even King Nebuchadnezzar recounts, no other God can save in this way. So these three men, they stood up to King Nebuchadnezzar and they said, we will not go your way. We are in the world, but not of the world. They were shielded, said in verse 16. They were hopeful and confident in God, verse 17. They were obedient to not worship false gods, in verse 18. They saw changed hearts, in verse 24. They were men of true integrity, because they were known as servants, the most high God. And they trusted in God. They were willing to die. They believed in him. So much so at the moment we see of persecution of Christians around the world. Just as in Acts 8, we hear post Stephen's murder, the church which could have just shrunk and hidden away, actually then spread around the world. So persecution is often happening in places like Nigeria and Iran and China, where the number of Christians just keeps on growing, that God's word cannot be stopped. But the act of people there who are faced daily with that choice, can I be in the world, but not of the world? So they are making that choice to say, no, I'm not going to follow these national rules. I'm going to stay for my God. If that means I'm persecuted, then I'm persecuted. 
So let's look at what those three amigos did and what we can learn. Verse 12, it said, they paid no attention to the king. They didn't serve his gods and they didn't worship the image of God, of gold. This is a threefold recipe we have for protection. So we've got to turn away from destructive habits. And the way we do that, the way we don't go the way that others might, is make sure we're listening, not to the king, but to the Holy Spirit, the voice of our good shepherd. We need to serve the one true God so that we know we're serving him. If we serve no one else, we risk being drawn in to serve those destructive pathways. And thirdly, we need to worship Jesus, that true treasure that will never rust or decay. It comes down to this, this call to build up constructive habits so that we can destroy destructive ones. Listen to the Holy Spirit, serve God and worship Jesus. Amen. Let's stay in the attitude of prayer. Margaret's going to come and lead us in our intercessions now. But just take a moment to ask afresh, how can I listen to you, God? How can I serve you? How can I worship you? How can I lay down those destructive habits and say, send them to that refiner's fire? Just take a moment now. Amen. Heavenly Father, on another beautiful morning, we come into your presence in the quietness of your house and we kneel before you with hearts open to hear your voice. We pray that you will still our souls. Many of us may be stressed for many different reasons. Some of us may be trying to cope with the raw pain of having lost a loved one, of trying to cope with ill health in our family or ourselves. Some may have financial problems or have lost their job. Some may be struggling to deal with the huge rise in the cost of living. Whatever our needs, Father God, we ask that you will reach out and touch each one of us and give us peace in our hearts and the ability to leave our stresses at the foot of your cross and trust in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, as we look across our world and see so much pain and suffering in so many areas, we want this morning to focus our prayers on the people of Ukraine. We find it hard to witness man's inhumanity to man. We hear and we see on our screens the appalling destruction of town after town and village after village. We watch family after family with their few belongings, trying to flee to a safer place to find food and water and shelter, not knowing if they will ever see their own homes again. Whilst we dwell on that thought, we want to thank you for all the hundreds of families across Europe and here in the UK who are offering to take in Ukrainian families and share their homes with them. Whilst we see all the heartbreak, we ask you to show us how we can pray for President Putin and for the people of Russia. Father God, please give us the words. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, as the days draw near to the Jubilee celebrations for our beloved Queen, we pray for her protection, her health, and especially her mobility. We pray for all the events which have been planned up and down the land 
and particularly for those in our own and surrounding villages. We thank you for the events which she has been able to enjoy this week and especially for the pictures showing her real joy as she watched the equine and military tributes to her 70 year reign at the Royal Windsor Show. Father God, we ask you to continue to pour your blessings upon her and all the royal family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we bring our prayers to a close by once again thanking you for the safe arrival of baby Jesse Cushing. We thank you for the joy this has been to Greg, Ellie and Josh, and also to grandparents, siblings and cousins. We thank you too for the joy it has brought to all of the church family. And we ask you to keep Ellie safe and well through the weeks ahead. We pray too for all those members of the church family we brought to you in our opening prayer and ask for your healing touch on all the stresses and strains that our loved ones and our friends and our neighbours may be experiencing. Amen, Amen and Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those that sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Margaret, as well, for leading us in our prayers. As we come to the very end of our service today, I wonder what you have been challenged by, what you're going to go away from here, knowing wanting to do to change and indeed to say i want to get rid of that to burn it to bury it let it go in that furnace we want to pray with you and join with you and say yes lord more of you and let's get rid of the rubbish so our closing blessing god who through the resurrection of our lord jesus christ has given us the victory give you joy and peace in your faith the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon us this day and all we love forevermore. Amen. And if you join with me, we say these wonderful words. We go into the world to walk in God's light, to rejoice in God's love and to reflect God's glory. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>